Welcome everybody. Hello. Good morning to everyone. Uh, to all uh, places around the globe, late at nights and early mornings, I see some colleagues around. Um, we will soon start. There are one or two people in the waiting room. Um, so let's, let's just start. So this is the second talk in the series of quantum computing and simulation um, organized by, um, by my group, me. Um, the, this time we have somebody from our own group. Last time we had um, I talk on optimization and um, from the Google group, the recent experiment in, um, that just came out. This week we'll talk about, we'll try to review um, what we have been doing in the group uh, the last year or so on analog quantum many body systems and how you can use, uh, instead of using digital approaches, analog approaches to do supremacy and also useful tasks. The speaker is Jirava Tangpanitanon, still trying to pronounce your name after six years being together, but I'll get there. Um, he, is, uh, he did his PhD with me, and now he's a postdoc in the group. Uh, I'm happy to take questions from the chat. Um, um, we'll try to save the questions for the end, but please do uh, ask in between as well, and I will try to pass them to, to Jiravat um, whenever it's possible. So without further ado, Jiravat, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you everyone for being here today. So, um, so I'm gonna be talking about quantum supremacy and machine learning in driven analog quantum many body system. So it's a great opportunity to have everyone here today. And if you have any questions, suggestions, so feel free to um, uh, discuss with us. Uh, so this is our group. We have, currently we have uh, two postdocs and uh, three PhD students. Another one is coming. Also, there's some part of our group also at uh, in Greek as well. And just a, a quick overview of uh, the research in our group. So the, the our background is from quantum simulation and uh, many body physics uh, with interacting photons. Um, some of the work, uh, for example, we have uh, uh, done in collaboration with the Google team um, using the 9 qubit chip to probe uh, many body localizations and and uh, the Hofstadter butterfly, actually the butterfly that you see on the uh, top right corner is from the data from the experiment and with some graphic. Um, mm -hmm. We also work on quantum simulations of uh, Majorana dynamics in collaboration with uh, Alex Samiet on uh, um, optical network, linear, linear, linear network. And recently we are exploring quantum machine learning and quantum supremacy coming from analog uh, simulation side. We also work on topology, quantum transport, uh, topological pumping, state transfer optomechanics um, and also even dissipative uh, system such, such as uh, the time crystal or flocket dynamics in the open system. Um, let me try to, okay. Right, so, so in this talk, I'm gonna briefly introduce, introduce the quantum supremacy and I'm gonna talk about two out of our recent works, which is the quantum supremacy in driven quantum many body system. Um, and the second part gonna be kind of the applications of, uh, of such system to machine learning. We're gonna be analyzing the accessibility and trainability of such system for, for NISC um, applications. So the definition of quantum supremacy was given by um, John Presque in 2012 which uh, he referred to as a point where quantum computers can do things that classical computers cannot, regardless of whether it's useful or not. 
And nowadays, the term is also referred to quantum advantage and quantum speed up. But I would like to just uh, stick to the word quantum supremacy for this talk. Um, so why do we need to show quantum supremacy? We can think of this question from a uh, quantum foundation perspective, which is uh, quantum physics promise a new paradigm for information uh, theory. For example, we have Bell experiments that reject uh, row call hidden variables. The quantum supremacy can be thought in a very similar sense, which are decided to reject extended church touring thesis. This, which um, a thesis that assert that uh, classical computers cannot simulate any physical process with polynomial overhead. Okay, so somehow quantum is a is a bigger set of of a classical theory. And there are a few requirements to show quantum supremacy. Um, first, you need a well-defined computational task. And second, you need a near-term quantum algorithm for that problem. Uh, third, you need to be able to calculate what is the time it takes for a, a classical computer or the competitors. Um, fourth, you need to uh, have a complexity theory assumption that uh, back up the claim. And the fifth is sort of an optional one, which is a, a efficient verification of the quantum supremacy. And in the previous uh, proposal for quantum supremacy tend to follow the same structure, which I summarize here in this slide. And the well-defined task is basically to compute or sampling from the uh, distribution, output distribution of uh, quantum dynamics, which is described by the unitary U. And you can think of system as a system of L qubits, for example. And you want to compute these probabilities up to additive error. So, and the additive error is nothing but the absolute error that we learn in high school. So P here is the exact um, answer and Q here is the solution that your machine give and this can be um, uh, a classical or quantum machines and the additive error just means that if you sum the errors um, over all configuration it should be smaller than some uh, constant okay but the, the the key point here is that we will specifically choose the U such that it's easy to implement directly into the quantum hardware, but it would take a non-polynomial time for a classical computer to compute. Okay. And the, uh, the, the assumption that we're gonna use is, is known as non-collapsing of the polynomial hierarchy to the third level, which basically means a weaker version of P equal NP, uh, P not equal NP. So if P equal NP, this would mean that if the solutions of a given problems uh, are easy to check, then they should be easy to find. Uh, if you don't believe that that is true, then basically you should believe that there uh, exists the quantum supremacy. Now, as you could have uh, noticed that the, the, the question is really specifically chosen to um, the advantage of the near-term quantum devices is like, uh, you have a monkey and a crocodile and then you ask them to climb a tree. Um, so obviously the monkey is going to win. Um, so however, um, this, is the, the, this is not the point because the point here is we want to show that uh, there exists an experiment that can reject the extended church touring thesis. Uh, and, and this experiment is enough. So these are the early proposals for quantum supremacy back in 2011 first by uh, uh, Scott Aronson and uh, Akipov, uh, which is a boson sampling, which is simply a linear optical network. You have a non-interacting photons, you send them in and then they interfere. Um, and you measure the, the, the output probabilities of, of the output photons. And because the photons are indistinguishable and there are many ways, exponentially many ways they can interfere with each other then this can give a very complex uh, output distribution, even though they are non-interacting. Um, so there are 
um, a few experiments that that um, demonstrate a boson sampling in a uh, small system. It's by small, I mean, if you want to really show the quantum supremacy, you need more than at uh, 50 photons in a well-defined loss mode. And the uh, second uh, proposal that uh, came at the same time is known as instantaneous quantum polynomial circuits. So these uh, quantum circuits that have consist of three main layers. The first layer is uh, is uh, uh, just a harder market, and the second layer is basically a random diagonal gate. So anything that random, but have only have diagonal term. And the third is the harder market. Okay. And, and in both methods has been shown that uh, with post selection, they can give a universal quantum computing. Now, so the, the IQP circuit is not that easy to implement as you can see, because they have um, long range interactions and also multi qubit, uh, two qubit, three qubit, four qubit gates involved. So later on, it was modified to a more a uh, realistic set of gates, which is just the nearest neighbor and and a poly matrix square root x square root y and t gate by uh, Boisel. And, and this proposal was later uh, realized uh, in, in quantum, in, in 53 uh, superconducting qubits last year. And so um, one might ask, whether it is so, is it that's it? Like because we we already achieved quantum supremacy, or is there anything else to do? So, in this aspect, I would to, I want to quote uh, Scott Aronson, uh, uh, which uh, he's saying that this is actually not a uh, milestone like moon landing, something that is achieved in the moment and is clear to everyone for all the time. And uh, actually, it's something that could be achieved and temporarily unachieved then re-achieve because by definition, we are beating something which is a classical computer and they can fight back as well, at least for a while. So in this sense, we are not at the end of the quantum supremacy, but rather the, um, uh, we are at the beginning of quantum supremacy. Uh, and so this motivates us to uh, explore more proposal of quantum supremacy, which are more realistic for uh, quantum hardware and also harder for uh, classical computers to, to catch up. So this brings us to another very active field of research, which is, which is the analog quantum simulators, first envisioned by Richard Feynman in 1982. Um, these are uh, will control quantum platform that's specifically built to implement complex quantum many body systems. And up to date, there are um, various platform that allow you to do so, um, be it core atoms in optical lattice, trap ions, superconducting circuits, linear optical network, interactive photons, which we um, work on a lot in the past and now as well, um, quantum dots, NV centers, and NMR. So in, uh, in, in analog quantum computing, uh, or quantum simulation, sorry, uh, there are the exit experiments that can beat existing uh, numerical techniques. For example, in this experiment by uh, Emmanuel Bloch to probe the two-dimensional um, many-body localization transition. Uh, however, this experiment did not compute quantities that are theoretically proven to be hard. So we don't say that the, the quantum supremacy is achieved in this experiment yet. Um, so there, there exist um, a few proposals for analog uh, quantum hardware, quantum supremacy in quantum hard, analog quantum hardware. Uh, the first one is by a group of Jen Isaac in uh, 2018, and which they consider uh, a 2D icing model. Um, although you need quite um, a bit of, of qubit, it, which in this case is uh, uh, 2,500 qubits to, to, to realize uh, supremacy. And uh, recently they also exit the 2D cluster state model, uh, 
uh, which again you need to implement the a four five body interaction, which is uh, something that is not natural to do so. So in our proposal, we would like to uh, uh, show the quantum supremacy for generic driven analog quantum hardware. So anything that can um, that you can think of that have drive and interactions. Okay. So specifically, we consider periodically driven systems. So you have a uh, um, your Hamiltonian has a static term and a drive term, and F here is periodic. Okay, so because it's periodic, we can uh, borrow tools from Floquet uh, theory, which basically we we define an evolution over one driving circle as a Floquet Hamiltonian, and we can thought of this uh, evolution as if it were produced from a time independent. Hamiltonian known as the effective Floquet Hamiltonian. And the system that we consider is, is a generic uh, many body system. So you can imagine um, a, 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 a bosonic uh, mode or uh, like where each side have zero, one, two, three particles. If you have qubit system, then it can be only uh, zero to one. Uh, now, we to see why uh, this system can give rise to uh, computational complexity. We're gonna do something that is similar to a Feynman part integral. So you can imagine that uh, after I evolve the system by by one cycle, I insert uh, an identity C1 here, and after the second driving circle, I insert another identities. So and you do for every driving circle. So you end up with the third line, which uh, basically the sum of all possible parts from the initial state to the final output. Okay. So now the next ingredients in our proposal is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis that state that um, generic isolated many bodies quantum system would thermalize by their own dynamics after a long enough time, regardless of their initial state. Now, thermalized in this sense is, is an isolated system. Thermalization is in the sense that every observable that you make uh, can be calculated from a micro chemical ensemble. Now, in the driven case, uh, it has been shown that these flocket operators can be thought as a random, as an instant from a random matrix drawn from the, what is known as circular orthogonal ensemble. So, so now you can see why, why the expression here is, uh, is complicated because you start off with a classical configuration uh, set M and then you multiply by random matrix. So you end up with a random configuration, classical configuration, and then you, you do so M time. And then you sum over all possible parts, which there are exponentially many of them. So the hardness of computation come from summing the sum of all the, these parts, not, not, not diagonalizing the Hamiltonian or the, the unitary. Now, so there is a standard framework to prove quantum supremacies. So what we want to say is that uh, a classical computer cannot efficiently estimate the uh, the output probabilities up to the additive errors unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the third level. Now, there are two standard ingredients that people use as to, to support this statement. The first one is known as the Sharpie hardness of the multiplicative, not the, addit not the additive, multiplicative approximation, um, which basically uh, the left-hand side is similar to uh, okay, it's a typo. It, there should not be a sum there, actually. Uh, the the left-hand side is the errors, and the right-hand side is some constant multiplied by the exact uh, answer. So if your answer is very small, the output probability is very small, then the errors here are going to be very small. So the multiplicative approximation is harder than additive approximation. Now, Sharpie hardness means that uh, problems uh, refer to problems of counting the number of solutions to NP problems. 
And the second condition that we need is known as anti-concentration, which basically saying that the output probability distribution should not concentrate on particular values. It should be widely like evenly spread, so it's hard for the classical computer to guess. Now I'm going to show you uh, how these two conditions lead to uh, the quantum supremacy uh, statement, which again is a, is, a, is a standard framework. First, uh, you have a strongly held conjecture in computer science that a classical machine should not be able to solve uh, uh, the Sharpie hard problem because if if it, sorry, a classical machine, if it can solve Sharpie hard problem, it would lead to the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy. But we, we believe that the polynomial hierarchy should not collapse. And the second ingredient is that we're going to assume that there is a classical machine that can do this additive error. And then the third step is slightly complicated. Is Basically, there exists uh, a theorem called Stockmeyer theorem that's saying that you can use NP uh, Oracle to help the machine to solve the multiplicative error. So you boost the machine for additive to multiplicative. But in order to enable the Stockmeyer argument, you need uh, what is known as anti-concentration uh, condition. Now, because if we believe that the the polynomial hierarchy should not collapse, then we should believe also that there should not exist such a classical machine that can do additive error. Okay, so, so now the next step, I'm gonna show you how to prove the multiplicative errors and anti-concentration in our case. Um, so the first step is we notice that if our evolution, the, the, the flocket operator is described by COE, then by definition, this can be written as a U dagger U, where U here come from uh, the CUE, which is known as the circular unitary ensembles. It's basically more, CUE is more general than uh, COE because it doesn't have this orthogonality constraint. The second step is to notice that actually the UCOE is the one that uh, produced by the previous uh, random quantum circuit proposal for quantum supremacies. So we can borrow tools from, 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 from that uh, work. Uh, so we can basically mathematically decompose this UCOE to a set of gates. Okay. Then the third step, which is a standard step in, in random quantum circuit is to map this circuit into a partition function of a classical uh, icing model with complex interactions, which are known to be sharply hard. Okay, so basically we want to write down the uh, this overlap on the left here as a partition function. So it's a this is AS is a degeneracy, and what inside is exp exponential component is just uh, energy of a complex icing model. Okay, so the exact mapping is is provided uh, in by by already by Boiso in the previous uh, proposal. So here we're gonna uh, explain to you in, but, but that proposal is, is, is uh, involved a lot of uh, heavy math. So in this talk, and in this work, we show you a more intuitive approach to understand this mapping. So if you want to know the math behind each step, we can uh, talk about it afterwards. But the, the pictorially, it looks this way. So imagine you have some circuits, right? The, the first step is to draw a circle between uh, non-diagonal gates. So I have my Hadamard and my square root X here are non-diagonal. So I draw a circle in between and my T gate here are diagonal. So I draw a circle that enclose all of them and you do so for every point, okay? And these circles are your classical spins, okay? And then the second step is you just draw connection between all these spins. So if you, if in your circuit, there is a connection between this spin and this spin, then you just draw uh, this one, right? And the spin between different qubits are connected by the control C gate. So you just draw that link 
and then you label the name accordingly. This is linked by the Hadama, this is linked by square root x, and so on. And the final step and is, you know what? Uh, yes? Let me give you some time to breathe and bring up a question. Um, why are we bumping to classical Isaac models as a question by the audience? Right, right. So, so first of all, this classical Isaac model is not physical because it has a complex interaction. And the reason that we map to this uh, classical complex Isaac model is because we know that their partition function is, is sharply hard to approximate. So it's kind of a um, um, conventional strategy in, in complexity theory. When you try to, that, to prove that something is hard, you map to something that you know that is hard. Um, is yeah. that answer? OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK, so, so now we have the diagram of the classical complex icing model with some label. The next step is to use this uh, lookup table to look for the interaction. For example, if you are, um, if your uh, Hadamard gate is acting between these two spin, it means that the interaction between these two spin ij is going to be plus one, and hi is the local field minus one on the left and minus one on the right. If you have a square root x acting on this two spin, then it means that these two spin coupling by couple by plus one ij with zero local field, for example. So by doing this, you can write down your uh, energy of your complex IC model easily. So, and now in our case, uh, remember that we are considering um, period periodically driven system. So I have a repeated COE and within the COE I can divide it into two CUE. Into, in the CUE I can decompose into the quantum circuit and the quantum circuit here I can just draw the complex icing model out of it. Okay, And the reason that we did this is because there is a theorem that's saying that unless this complex icing model, unless the energy of these complex icing models are restricted to a certain values, very specific, very specific value, like zero pi over two, two pi over two, then we know for sure that um, the partition function is uh, hard to approximate up to uh, multiplicative error. Now, since our icing models are completely random, then this provides um, uh, evidence that uh, that is also sharply hard uh, for us to comp to estimate the COE dynamics. Now, so this, this slide is the most mathematical slide in my talk, and, and then after this, it's gonna decay afterwards. So just, just bear with me. This is a slide about showing anti-concentration in our system. So the first step is we recast the, this overlap as uh, something that depends on the I can uh, states of my flocket operators and something that depends on the the I can values of my flocket operators. Okay, so so D here is just an overlap of my I can stay to the initial and the final state. And now the second step is we use a, a well-known identities from the COE that the distribution of the D here would follow what is known as the best cell function of the second chi. You can think of this as some kind of um, very close to uniform distribution. Um, and the third step is to notice that uh, because this phase here have a uh, modulo two pi, then when M, which is the number of driving period is very large, what happened is this, uh, M E T here gonna be much larger than two pi. And you have what is called energy folding uh, effect, which means that every phase has to be between zero and, and two pi. So, and this effect is known to erase all the correlations that you have among the, the, the phase. So with this effect, it, this phase follow the Poisson distribution. So you can lastly think of it as a, it's a random, numbers that distribute from zero to two pi. Okay, 
So now the the question is 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 like a statistical exercise where you know to the distribution of two variables and you want to know the distribution of the left hand side. So we can do this by first writing the left hand side as a real part and the imaginary part. And then we use the uh, product distribution uh, formula and the central limit theorem to show that each part and the real part and the imaginary part should follow the normal distributions. And finally, because the probability that we want is just a square sum of these two, and we know that the square sum of two Gaussian variables follow the chi-square distribution, and this gives rise to the final result, which is known as the Potter-Thomas distribution. So n here, just to remind you, is the size of your Hilbert space and P is the output uh, distribution. So, so it's highly unlikely that your output will concentrate at particular value. So P is like usually very small, exponentially small. Uh, Potter Thomas distribution is also an indicator that your system has uh, uniformly explored all the Hilbert space. And you can show that it's, it's indeed follow the anti uh, conditions. Now, so this is a summarize uh, so far. On the black line, you have a standard uh, framework of quantum do, supremacy. Do you have a, one more yes. question from Chris. Why is it important to show anti-concentration? Right. You want, you so want the, to... the stock Myers, the stock Myers uh, does not apply to every uh, unitary. So uh, uh, it doesn't apply to a every uh, problems. It's only to apply to some problems. And in order to make sure that the stock market apply to the problems that you are solving, uh, this is where the anti-concentration come in because it, it means that when you realize many instant of your Froquet operators, this, this Froquet operator, they're not, you know, like uh, concentrate on particular values. So there is a high chance that Stockmeyer's theorem will apply. So, so it's more like a, an, an evidence. It's not uh, a, a direct uh, uh, condition, like a proof or condition. It's more like evidence that the, if you have anti concentration, then Stockmeyer should be able to apply to your problem. Okay. So, this, so um, if it follows up, can you see the comments? Because uh, maybe it's difficult to put. Tutorially. Um, so if the probability is larger than gamma, then we have the evidence we need. Can you see the chart? Yeah, yeah. So, so okay, if you look at the definition of the anti concentration again, exactly. um, it means that there's a, a lot of non zero probabilities. So if you are probability concentrate on certain values, then there are going to be a lot of uh, probabilities that have zero values. Um, is this answer the question? Yep. I, I, okay. Yeah, I think I think Christos is okay. Thank you, Christos. Um, good to know your surname as well, but uh, maybe later. Right. Okay, so, let's so, go. Yeah, just to summarize that we, we, we use the fact that generally driven analog uh, quantum system thermalized and can be described by COE. And from COE, we, we use the standard tools to prove uh, all the complexities. Now, just a side note for experts that to compare to the original uh, random quantum circuits, uh, our system actually quite different than, than that system. Firstly, we have a discrete time reversal symmetries because it's periodically driven system which means that our COE actually achieved from the flocket operator, which is the evolution only one driving period. Whereas the CUE in random quantum circuits is achieved from the entire evolution. And also uh, we don't have the TDSI properties. This is a properties that tell you how uniformly distribute your unitary, uh, 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 evolution, uh, unitary evolutions are. We don't have that, okay? but we have the same uh, complexity. Now, just to give an example, so we give a simple example of 1D quantum icing model and the 1D Bosnabat model. And you just drive it periodically, basically turn on and off, on and off. Um, 
in the icing we drive it with the global magnetic field on the bosa bar we drive it the with the coupling the hopping and here we show that basically every uh, quantities that we measure is follow very closely the statistic that we expect so for example on the left on the uh, upper left here is the statistic of the eigen states the d is follow exactly what is coe predicted uh, on the lower left corner is the statistic of the eigen energies the way we define is, is we first sort the eigen values phi and then we consider two adjacent uh, gaps and then we calculate the r which is the the smaller gap divided by the larger gap and the statistic is just a histogram of this r okay so the red line is the what is coe predicted after one driving period the blue line is what happens after many driving periods which we which we know to be a poor song because all these uh, uh, phase are uncorrelated and and we see that the numerics uh, fit this uh, quite nicely. And on the right hand side is the uh, distance from the output distribution to the Porter Thomas distribution. And so, as you can see, that we can, after 10 periods or so, the, the system goes nicely uh, to a very small, uh, very close to Porter Thomas. Um, actually, the larger the system side, the closer it is. Um, so, summary so far, we have generic uh, driven analog which lead to COE and COE can lead to supremacy. And now the question is, is, uh, is there any use uh, in, this, in this system, right? So mm -hmm. let, me, let, me make, let me make a quick break there so you can breathe, just for the audience. We are presenting two papers today. Um, I thought maybe it's good not to overtake uh, the series with our own work. So, I asked Tirava to put the second work, which is moving now into an application. So first work was about useful, sorry, about analog systems, cold atoms, ions, um, and anything that can be done in the lab has been done for years, hard to simulate, we knew. Now we kind of proved, or we have very strong indications that they can also produce supremacy. And now she will move to, to the second work they're both on archive. You can check them out if you want and get back to us if you have questions on what can you do with those things. Yeah. So I, if, if I won't take too long for the second part and it will be less uh, mathematics. Um, so the question of how can quantum supremacy be useful bring us to the noisy intermediate scale quantum device or NIST devices, uh, which basically is something that don't have error corrections, 50 or 1,000 qubits also, short range, and should be robust to noise. Um, so one of the applications that uh, uh, people are interested in is the machine learning. And uh, for a very quick introduction, you can divide the machine learning into three types. You have a supervised learning where you train the data with the label, for example, flags, flagging spam emails, speech recognitions. You have unsupervised learning, such as classifications. You have reinforcement when you train without the label data. Um, and um, the reinforcement learning, where you kind of uh, let the machine try something and then you uh, give the score to it, whether this is a plus, like, good thing to do or not a bad thing to do. So this is like alpha code, for example. And although now the machine learning is, is, is very powerful, there are still a lot to explore in the unsupervised learning. This is, I think, somewhere that a, maybe a quantum machine can uh, find its application. And the field of quantum machine learning uh, can be divided into four sections, depending on whether you're solving a classical problem or quantum problem, and whether you use a classical algorithms or quantum algorithms. And uh, the field itself refer to both NISC and fault tolerant quantum algorithms. In our talk, we're gonna focus more on the quantum algorithm for a, a classical problems. A common way to operate this NISC device is to use what is known as variational, uh, sorry, quantum algorithms, uh, which basically you parameterize your uh, quantum evolutions, and then you calculate the cost function, which is a function of the observable. And this cost function represents some problems that you are solving, be it a quantum chemistry, a finite ground state of a, 
of uh, molecular molecules, for example. Um, and then you try to minimize this cost function by uh, changing some parameters in your evolution using a classical optimizer. Um, there exists uh, um, uh, a digital analog VQA where you can think of it as a, a series of uh, single qubit gates and the entangling gates where the entangling gate is, is basically anything that you can implement in your, in, your, in your system. You can just turn on to increase the entanglement in your answers. Um, so in order to have a useful uh, BQA, you need to satisfy these uh, three criteria, which is uh, expressibility, trainabilities, and implementabilities. And so far, uh, we haven't reached uh, three of them at the same time yet. For example, you can do a hard three fog answers for quantum chemistry. This is a product state, so it has the low expressibilities. It's easy to train. It's relatively easy to implement. You can have a high, a more complex ANSAS, which is known as a UCC, unitary couple cluster for quantum chemistry, which is highly expressible. You can, you can train, but it's very hard to implement. It's similar to QLA, quantum approximate uh, algorithms, where high express, expressibility, uh, easy to train, hard to implement. And you have a, a hardware efficiency, which is uh, basically a random quantum circuit, which is a highly expressible, but cannot be trained. Actually, it's theoretically proven that it cannot be trained uh, and it's easy to implement. So in our talk, we, we're not gonna solve this uh, problem yet, but we want to show you that in the analog system is similar to a random quantum circuit in the sense that you have high expressibility and easy to implement. But we want to show also that because we have this a many body localization effect or MBL, we can use this MBL to enhance the trainabilities of our system. Uh, um, yes? Do you have a, one more question by, by our own uh, Kishore this time? Mm. Trainability depends on regime. Which regime, parenthesis circuit depth, you mean? Trainability depends on loss function. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a good uh, point. So if you have a, a, a shallow circuit depth, then, then your expressibility also low as well. Here I refer to, to uh, a very deep circuits where you can express everything that you want, but uh, it's, you have what is known as, as a barren plateau where your cost function is exponentially flat with the number of qubits. Of course, there is a recent development that actually this barren uh, uh, plateaus or also depends on what type of the cost function you make, whether your cost function is a global cost function or the local cost function. If you have a global cost function, then even though your circuit is small, it is shallow, you, you have this barren plateau as well. So, but in the end, uh, here in this slide, I refer to deep circuit in, in both random circuits and in our work as well. Okay. Uh, now the setting is actually exactly the same as before. So you have, uh, a driven analog system, but now the only difference is, is not periodic anymore. So each layer, I'm going to change some parameters in my Hamiltonian. Okay. But other than that, the rest is, is the same. Now I'm going to define some generic phase that associate with this uh, unitary. So I'm going to call it thermalized. If I, so, so you here is just one slide one layer, I'm going to call it thermalized. If I take this slide and I apply it many times to any state and that state thermalized, and I'm going to call this U as many body localized if that is not true because of a large disorder. So, so now I can divide it, my case into four cases, whether it's driven, undriven, or is it uh, thermalized or not thermalized? So previously we only consider one case, which is a thermalized and driven. And you can define different statistics to each of these case. So when you don't have the drive, you, you can define your statistic at the level of the Hamiltonian, which if you thermalize, you have is GOE, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. If you don't thermalize, you have a Poisson and when you drive, you divide statistic at the level of the unitaries. 
So if you thermalize, you get the COE as before. If you don't thermalize, you get the poor song. Okay. And just to summarize all this GOE, COE, GOE means ensemble of matrices whose elements are independent normal random variables subject to orthogonality. COE is the same as GOE plus that is complex and is unitary. CUE that you get from random circuit is the same as COE, but there is no orthogonality assumption, uh, uh, conditions. And Poisson is basically uncorrelated eigenvalues. Now here, just to show you an example of a physical system that can display these four phases, it's basically the same uh, 1D IC model as before, but now I change uh, uh, W to 20J, where J is the coupling, in order to get the many body localization. And so the, the graph here is the what is expected from, uh, from the COE and Poisson. You can see that everything match the prediction quite nicely. And COE and GU, GOE is, is very close to each other. Okay. So the next step is now we want to analyze the expressibility of this system, I'm, I'm gonna stack them up, okay? And what I'm showing here is basically, if you stack them up, even though they have different statistics, all of them follow the CUE distribution, which is the same distribution at the random quantum circuit. So, so here, are, which mean that uh, all four cases, they are highly expressible. They can express certain distributions that cannot be efficiently uh, compute by a classical computer. And, and these three graphs here are just the evidence of the CUE. Okay. So on the bottom upper left is the statistic of the eigenstate defined as, as before. Uh, the, the, the blue area is what predicted from the CUE. So you can see that they, they fit uh, quite nicely. And the bottom one is the level of statistic. Again, it fit nicely and on the Right hand side is the distance from the Potter Thomas distribution as a function of, oh, sorry, I missed the, the, the egg label is the number of driving cycles. Okay. So you can see that for a driven thermalize, the system go to Potter Thomas very quickly as we expected. If you don't drive and you have MBL, then the system, although you get Potter Thomas at the end, but it's very slow. And the driven MBL, uh, the driven MBL and undriven thermalize seem to have a similar uh, decay rate. Now, although the long time limit of these two cases are very similar, there are, in short term, there are some properties that is distinctly different uh, in, in the four cases, uh, which basically the MBL case have some short-term memories or temporal correlation. So what we do here is we calculate the difference between the output distribution from the after M cycle and M plus delta M cycles. So you can see that for the uh, thermalized case, uh, each layer, they basically have zero correlations because this is what we expected from chaotic or thermalization as well. But for MBL, we have a sort of decaying uh, correlations and next, we will show that it's exactly because of this correlation, you can uh, do some useful uh, training when, when, when you try to do machine learning. Okay. And, and now, now we move on to trainabilities for, for machine learning. And we're going to consider what is known as generative modeling, which is an unsupervised task. Uh, basically, you want to find an underlying uh, distribution of your data set. So you can imagine you have a let's say a customer and your, your products and your, your customer uh, label your products, whether they buy or don't buy given products. And you want to know a distribution of this customer so you can predict the behavior of, of them. So what we want to do, to do when training is basically, we want to uh, change our um, um, variational parameters such that our dis output distribution is very close to the distribution of this data. Of course, you, we don't know the distribution of this data. So what we can do is the some sort of histogram of a given data. Uh, 
uh, and that's a cost function. So in this case, we're gonna use an artificial training data which are drawn from uh, classical icing models. Um, so so it's, it's an all-to-all -all coupling model with some random uh, uh, random weight. Uh, now this is our training protocol, which is the simplest and in, and I have to say it's inefficient. But we focus on the simplest protocol, and we want to know how different phases display in this uh, very simple protocol. Okay, and this is how it works. So you start off with uh, with your initial state, okay, and then you evolve by one uh, layer, and then you repeat again. Uh, sorry, you 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 make make a measurement, calculate the cost function, and then you come back, and then you try another unitary measures, come back. And then, so you do a few times, and then you choose the best one. And then you move to the next layers, and you do, you do the same. So you sequentially growing your, your, your answers this way. It is inefficient because in each step, we throw away a lot of unitary that we realize. We only pick the best one, okay? And, and you repeat this for all four cases. Again, the goal here, I want to see how the training behavior change with the phase. So on the left hand side, you have the cost function as a function of the driving cycles. Now, the driving cycle go from one to 10 to the four. And you can see that in each, in the four cases, they display very different uh, uh, properties. So in the thermalized case, the system cannot be trained. The cost function uh, does not reduce at all. Uh, whereas when you have the MBL, because you have these short term correlations, the cost function reduced after some time. And the behavior are different whether you drive or don't drive. So the lowest one is when you drive, you have the system start to decay and then slow down and then come to the steady state. Whereas for the, if you don't drive, the system decay and then decay again with a slower rate. And then somehow they shoot up again. So, and what is interesting is now if I plot the final training at a steady state uh, at the long time limit as a function of my disorder, you see sort of a phase transition in the learning accuracy. So here at the lower disorder, the system thermalized and you get the flat plateau here. Um, and when the system uh, um, localized, then you see the, the quite a sharp transition and then you see the flat plateau again, which basically if you are if you are MBL, then you're always learning the same accuracy. Okay. Uh, the purple one is with the drive and the black one is without the drive. Now without the drive, we stop here because it's taking too long for the system to converge. Now if I plot uh, the level statistic of my system as a function of the disorder, we see the phase transitions again from, this is the average level spacing. So it's changed from uh, thermalized and thermalized. So you can see that the, the, the transition as uh, indicated by the uh, level statistic is very close, although not exactly, but very close to the transition that we see from the training accuracy. So in from these results, we conclude that uh, the, the phase of the NIST device can play a very significant role in the, uh, in the, in the machine learning applications. And just to conclude the, my talk that we have, I have shown three points. First, that you can achieve quantum supremacy in generic driven analog quantum many body system. Um, second is you can use MBL and the drive to enhance the trainability of the analog uh, system for gener generative modeling while remaining in the quantum supremacy regime. Um, a third is that uh, this learning accuracy depends solely on the face of the underlying software, uh, hardware. So with that, I would like to finish uh, my talk and yep, any questions. Okay, thanks, Javad. Um, virtually. Um, there is uh, there is one question I missed earlier by Hermani. Um, uh, why can random circuits be trained? 
I think he's referring to your earlier things. Maybe right, there's right, a right, confusion right, here, right. but yeah, maybe you can take it. So the, the, the random circuit, if um, has a properties called uh, TDSI, which basically is generate a very random unitary matrix. Um, and uh, it has been shown theoretically um, by the Google team in 2018 that with the TDSI properties, uh, is follow that your cost functions uh, will decay exponentially as a number of qubits. So that's kind of a mathematical answer. The physical answer would be when you have a chaotic system, it means every small thing that you change, you end up with a completely different state. And that's why it cannot be trained. It's actually the same in our system as well when we have a COE. Exactly. It changed a little bit, everything changed. But when you have an MBL, this this when you can do that. This is very important as well to highlight that analog also suffers from the same problem, but we can tune it bending on the face here. So we bring up the disorder, we go deeper in the localizer zim, we can train it. This is the picture it has later on that you go around. But if you're in the chaotic regime, the disorder regime, it just goes crazy everywhere, it cannot be trained. Um, would, would that, does that answer your question, Hermani? Okay. Any other questions, comments, points? We have a couple of minutes. You can also ask on the microphone if you want. Um, now that he's not, Jirevat is not speaking. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. State your name, please, and just yeah, uh, sure. go ahead. Just the name and affiliation will help as well. Like where you where you speaking from? Computer for quantum technology. Ah, so it's Kishore again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Kishore. Uh, uh, like I have a small question with so like when you like uh, like. Uh, um, uh, so you put your uh, Hamiltonian sandwich between between the like. Uh, gates right like some i'm like can you just show me the circuit or like like how do you uh, what is the model that you have like a bit uh which which work you're talking about the second part or the first part yeah, the second one yeah uh-huh so so you have like uh you said that you like somewhere in the middle you like you uh, sandwich the hamilton like the analog part and uh, so something is fixed and something you like what do you tune like i mean Right, right, right. So, 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 right. So, so each each driving cycles you evolve by this Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. This Hamiltonian has the static term and the term that varies with time. What we change is the parameters in this uh, in this static term. So, so, so for specific example, if we look at the Ising model, mm -hmm. because this numerics, some I mean, there's the theory, the abstract theory, and there's the numerics. Okay, exactly. So we, we change the local magnetic fields here, you see in front of this. Yeah, yeah. That's a variation of mm -hmm. There's another yeah, I forgot to mention. Yeah, yeah there is yeah, this is this is important. So you change the local here, the variation is the local magnetic field. So it's slightly different than in digital where you 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 have local rotations. Mm -hmm. Here you have local um, parameters in your Hamiltonian. It can also be the coupling, but here we found to change the local magnetic field, it's easier I as see. well ex experimentally. So, so basically like, I mean, your, your couplings, they are all fixed. And this, this theta IM term is something that you kind of tune and through it, you like kind of like, you know, explore the landscape. Like, exactly, uh, exactly, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And you show that basically it's, uh, it can, um, like it, it's excess expressible, like it can, uh, uh, like, uh, represent all possible like states which you want to go through to train and like exactly and, yes mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and and <laughs> we connect we connect that to the physics because if you go back to the previous slide so that theta uh, can also be seen if that theta is random is disorder basically then this kind of models this is a spin model but similar for both hubbard you can have many body localized spaces or you can have thermalized spaces if the disorder is large compared to interaction the system localizes Mm -hmm. And then in that localization regime, you can actually train it. If you show the, the picture with the balls, Jirevat, uh, go, go to the slide with uh, uh, the train, exactly. So 
you see, you start from initial state, then you generate lots of these states around the sphere, that's for a certain range of the thetas within a parameter range, then you generate the other one, the other one, and then you train the system because it's localized. But at the same time, you change the parameters fully expressible so you can go anywhere. So you, it's about interplay between expressibility and trainability here. You need expressibility to make sure you can go anywhere, but then you, you go into this localized regime in order to train because if you are really expressible, fully chaotic, you cannot train. So basically the benefit comes because you have the information of, about the, whether you are in the MBL regime or not. Exactly. And, yeah. then, and then because of that, you kind of uh, move along this cliff and like, and keep yourself safe from those plateaus and all. Uh, the, 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 the plateau comes... Um... Because, you know, generally if I think about it, like, if you let it to, you know, like, uh, I mean, random circuits and all, as those by, like Google papers suffer or, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the loss function, you will suffer for these issues. But in this case, like, I mean, as you see, like, you know, you have this uh, nice MBL thing, which kind of tells you that, ah, like, uh, if you, if you kind of uh, drift into that part, you will have the, you will have the problem. So, so better not go there, move, uh, move within the MBL thing and, uh, and go to the target that you wanted to achieve, like with some approximation that you will have initially in mind. I think if I can rephrase Kishore's question, Jeva, is like, do we suffer from barren plateaus here and when we will suffer? Can we avoid them or what yeah, kind yeah. of so, so, so I, 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 I think Dimitri, you know, like, uh, I, I think you guys, you guys can avoid them. Like it seems like because you, this MBL thing, like you have that information. I, I was just, it was more like a comment that I think, mm -hmm. is it because of this, you know, this extra information about the phase that you have, you manage to kind of avoid it. I mean, obviously yeah. I need to read in detail of your paper to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, so I think avoid is the, is the correct word. Mm -hmm. I would not say that we solved the problem in the sense that actually there is a barren plateau in our system because if you stack everything up, um, uh, let me try to, uh, sorry, oops. If you stack everything up, like, like below here, then we know that it's follow the, the CUE statistic, which is exactly the same as the random, random circuit. circuit yeah. So everything should be the same. The barren plateau should be there as well. Mm -hmm. But what we notice is that the difference is, is not the global thing, it's the, is the, is the short term correlation, is the short, short term memories that MBL have. So, so we kind of avoid this in the sense that we don't train the whole thing at the same time, we train it sequentially because we know that step by step, MBL, the system can still remember where they were with the MBL. So, so yeah, we, I would say we, we avoid the barren patterns. I see. And when you move along this, your gradients are like good enough to be trained. You know? Sorry? I mean, I'm saying that when you move along, uh, like move uh, with this uh, short term correlation, keeping mm -hmm. in mind this thing, then- Yeah, the landscape is still, yeah. 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 There's yes. a, a gradient. The, I have to say that here, in what we do is we don't use any gradient. It's, it's even simpler than gradient descent. Uh, uh, the, the reason that we don't use gradient descent here is we want to make sure that every time we stack up the layer, we don't change the phase. If we do gradient descent, then you have no control whether which phase you're going to end up. Right? You might start with the MBL, but then because you change it, then, then you might end up into the thermal phase. You know what, I just um, last question, and maybe I will talk to you offline sometime. This is interesting. I like uh, this word. So, so, so what I'm saying that, so then how do you kind of update your parameters? Like, is it like kind of some kind of momentum based update or is it like, I mean, or do you like, is this gradient free approach? Like, I mean, how do it's you- gradient -free, you know, yeah, you, It's gradient free. You basically uh, yeah, try yeah. it in time. Mm -hmm. So, so, so imagine like in this, uh, Huber space, the first step is you, you try different directions and then you just pick sure. the best direction. Generate then, states in the sphere and then you pick the best one co compared to the cost function to go there. But it's like, it's, there's, no, there's no optimization gradient. No, no, no gradient involved, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly the next step we want to see how we can improve this to, and then start comparing with classical, I mean, other kind of digital based machine learning. How fast does it learn? Here we're proving that it can, learn and is is based on the face of the system and that can keep you kind of safe by the plateaus but we are not 
benchmarking of how fast it can let, how fast this process happening. This is this is the next. Step. There is one more question from the audience. Uh, I just want to bring it up um, by Suan. Uh, I have a question about quantum mapping. Let's say I can formulate Hamilton. My problem, uh, I think, is it refers to chemistry and molecules. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, one of our colleagues from Google to talk about Hartree Fock and chemistry um, uh, problems on a quantum computer. And I think this will be there. What I can say very briefly, this is out, uh, this question is really out of the of the theme today, but um, I mean, Jerome, if you want to comment briefly, and then I think next week we'll be better. What is the question again? Uh, I'll take it. It's the question uh, is about how we can calculate eigenmodes of molecules and um, and quantum states, uh, and whether we can map Hamiltonian chemistry Hamiltonians into hardware, if I understand it well. Okay, this is. Um, this is done. If people are trying to do it. There's just so recent experiments by different groups. Uh, but I think it's, it's a little bit outside the spoke today. Basically, very briefly to sketch the answer, you start from your um, from your uh, fully interacting uh, Schrodinger and Hamiltonian. Then you can actually go to the second quantization. You get quantized modes, and then you can do what the various transformations are called. For example, Jordan Wigner. You can go from quantum modes to to spins and then those spins you can actually map into a quantum hardware that's one way to go but we'll, um, i think we're going to hear much more next week about this on it's exactly the topic of the next talk by uh, by people from uh, the google quantum group okay any other any other question comment Okay. All right, so if there are no more um, questions or comments, thank you all for joining the second session. Uh, there are definitely two more to go uh, next Friday. We'll try to move the time a little bit, hope, but um, we'll try to, at least for the American speakers, uh, this is the only time they could do it. I know it's tough for the European of colleagues that's quite early in the morning um, and uh, we'll hopefully see you in the next two sessions and maybe there will be more so thank you and bye-bye